Thank you. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be with this august, accomplished group. And I'm so thankful, uh, just from schmoozing this morning, I have three people who have volunteered to help my foundation, the Stroke Recovery Foundation, um, create a podcast program. We're developing a program for everything about um, stroke recovery and everything about stroke prevention in English, not clinician terms. So thank you very much. And I'm so thrilled to speak. And the reason I'm so thrilled to speak more than virtually everybody here. 21 years ago, I couldn't speak, period. I was aphasic. I was in a nursing home. And I'll tell you a bit more about it. S step back a few years from that fateful day, your Auric, that fateful minute. I was uh, in 575 Fifth Avenue, GE headquarters, at a training program where they asked us to get into the call center business to sell their long distance services. And so, with a few other people, we did that. And so we were commuting to Lincoln, Nebraska. We had 14 seats. We had an apartment out there. We were working hard, uh, probably drinking too much, um, commuting back and forth, a lot of stress, and the money was tight. That's entrepreneurial world, as all you know. That fateful week, I happened to be not commuting, and I was in Greenwich. And that fateful day was dark in January, a dark Connecticut January day. I had a terrible headache. So I went to the doctor, left the office early, very uncharacteristic of me. Went to the doctor, he told me I had the flu. Sent me on my way, so I went home. I knew Debbie wouldn't be home because she was teaching an exercise class for women that evening. Instead of cooking dinner, as I normally did, she married the chef. I went up to bed. About 15, 20 minutes after getting in bed, I felt something snap in my brain. And paralysis set in immediately to my right side. Scrambling, I got to the phone, 911. I'm having a stroke, but don't come. I had a brain attack. Well, they didn't come. They actually listened to me. Unbelievable. Then I had the bright idea that I should be down on the first floor. So I rolled out of bed, rolled over to the staircase, thinking I could just hold on to the banister sitting down and kind of shuffle down on my rear end. But instead, I lost control and rolled down a fly stairs. Passed out on the living room floor and woke up when Debbie got home. Um, her gar our garage was underneath the house, and so the house, when it made some noise, I woke up. As soon as I heard her come into the house, yell down to her, come up, I'm having a stroke. She came running up, called 911. Oh, you're home, Mrs. Mandel. Richfield is a small town. My voice got gobbled. I lost my voice, and that was it. I was in the hospital for 10 days hiccuping and then a nursing home for three and a half months. Four to five hours of therapy, every kind of therapy, physical, occupational, speech, and, th and therapy for the therapy. <laughs> it's quite an experience. And then I had a couple of years of outpatient therapy, four to five hours a day, five days a week. Skip over that now. Just a little time went by. We moved to Florida. And um, I, was, I was at a uh, networking meeting, a marketing networking meeting. And, um, and the microphone was coming to me because everybody in the room was asked to speak about themselves for a minute, do a one minute routine and their business. Well, as the microphone came to me, I tried to get the words out. Now, I couldn't do it. 
I had to speak to a group. I couldn't do it. I passed the microphone on to the person on my right. That was the first networking event I had been to since the stroke, and I didn't realize, because I was speaking individually, that I couldn't speak publicly. Now that is not doable if you're in the marketing world, and you're an entrepreneur, and you're a guy who's used to speaking plenty, having been a management consultant and an adjunct professor. This was totally undoable. So I looked for solutions, and frankly, there weren't very many, because I had had lots of speech therapy. A few years later, a 17-year-old lad and his father came to my office. I was doing volunteer brain injury counseling for one of the local hospitals. And he came to my office. I had met him in the hospital. And in, in each case, each person that I talked to, I said, if you want some additional um, talking or counseling, um, this is my card. Please contact me. Well, they did. So they walked in. They sat down. The father proceeded to talk. The son sat dejectedly and depressed in the side. I said, you know, if you could excuse us, um, I think I need to talk to your son privately. The father resisted being protective of the son, but the son piped up and said, Dad, please leave. So I talked to the, as soon as the father was out of the room, the boy just exploded. No one knows what I'm going through. The boy had had a TBI, traumatic brain injury, he had had a motorcycle accident. He took his hat off, and I saw the bandages on his head where he'd had, uh, had the surgery. And he kept saying over and over again, nobody knows, nobody knows. And I was supposed to start FGCU, which is a branch of the Florida State University right near our area. He was supposed to start college the next day. So we talked for a while. He said, you know, I'm comfortable with you. I'm comfortable talking to you. And I told him a little bit about myself and that I'd had a brain injury. I said, have you ever talked to anybody who's had a brain injury? I mean, I understand you talk to psychologists, which do everything they can do, but they haven't walked the walk. And so, no, he hadn't. So we talked for some more, and one thing led to another. The father came back in, the boy clammed up. And he came back once or twice more, but then they went back to Ohio. There we were. One thing I have learned is that to engage people in t today's world, one needs to schmooze. Today, schmoozing, three people signed up for my podcast to help me. That's schmoozing. Now, what is schmoozing? I mean, I know it's talking, obviously, but schmoozing is engaging a person on their level. On their level, not on my level, on their level. And I try and find a common, some kind of a common ground. In the case of the Christmas, Christmas tree gal, <laughs> I, I mentioned going to Christmas stroll up in Nantucket. And then we had a nice conversation, because she had never been there, but she should go. And the young lady over here, she has brain in her, she has stroke in her, in her background. And she is a, a very giving gal, and she was, she was anxious to do it. And the young gal here, who just spoke, I thought she would be great at helping people feel better with her mind-body approach. So that's kind of like schmoozing, rather than just talking about the weather. But one of the things I do when I talk to somebody on the phone, I I try and find some, some commonality with them. I mean, not politics, is, not politics. I was going to say current events, but not politics, because you don't know what people's political views are these days, particularly. But the baseball, the World Series, something. Something to get the conversation going so that they, people engage with you. We were, going to, we were going to Australia, and I was trying to get tickets on the phone through American Airlines. And we needed, the doctor said, you aren't going unless you're getting business class seats. So 
I started, I, one person after another I'm talking to and I'm getting nowhere, hanging up the phone. That's what you do when you're, when you're not getting any place with a call center. <clears throat> but I don't ask, Saturday morning I went, I said, this is the last time I'm trying this. If not, I'll get some service to do this. I got this gal on the phone. Somehow we got talking about stroke. But turned out her father had stroked a stroke, unfortunately, the week before. I stopped talking about me, started talking about her father. Well, I have to tell you an hour later, I have my tickets. That was the beauty of, of schmoozing with people. Schmoozing with your mouth, skip the thumbs. I would like to say that we can help. What are your stars? What are the things you want to accomplish? Each one of you, you're here, you've done this great program, but you all have things you want to do. Find your stars. So as I wind up, that 14 center, um, that 14 seat call center, when the business was sold, um, we had two call centers in the Philippines. We had one in Panama near Cologne. We had four of them in, uh, in Ohio. And that little one we had in uh, Lincoln was now 150 seats in a local location. A serious success. And so I can help you find your stars and have success. I've seen a few things, I've done a few things, I've built a few things, and I can help you build yours. Thank you.